Okay, so my name is Fionn Davis. I'm a consultant here in the emergency department at the Leicester Island Infirmary. Um, and my personal bit of this story is that SADS has always been a topic of interest to me as an a &E consultant. I used to do quite a lot of teaching about it. And um, that particular day in October, four years ago, I'd just finished doing a presentation at home. I can't remember who I was going to give the talk to on that occasion, but I'd just finished the PowerPoint and headed off for one of our evening shifts that starts at 6 p.m. I got in the doors, and it was literally an hour later that Joe arrived in the recess room. And I remember the next morning reflecting on how tragic it was and emailing my pal at EMAS, Gareth Mallon, who unfortunately can't be with us today because he's uh, doing an EMAS shift, and saying, you won't believe what happened yesterday. I literally finished the, the last slide on my PowerPoint, headed straight into work, and uh, we had another death. And that's the sad bit of this, another death. And Gareth and I had already been trying to spread the word and get awareness, really, of the warning signs of this disease. And that's one of the things we're going to teach you today, and I'm going to cover that in the first lecture. So that uh, for those who are lucky enough to have some warning signs, at least people might pick up on it. And the other half of the equation is to do something about it when it actually happens. So that's what today is all about. Now, I'm quite conscious, looking at the delegate list, that we've got quite a mixed bunch of you in the audience. So some people are students and quite young and well know one end of an ECG from another and other people are consultants and have to do this all day every day. So I hope, sincerely hope today there's something in it for everybody and that each talk will have bits that are useful for you. We've got some lectures this morning and then we decided to give you a quiz because everybody likes a quiz. So there are some quizzes um, that we're going to set out on the tables for the third session for you to self-assess yourself on some of the things that we'll teach you during the morning. Uh, we have got some prizes. I've got a rugby ball signed by Martin himself, and we've very generously got a prize from one of our sponsors, which is the, uh, an Amazon voucher. So it's worth trying to get some points in the quiz, so it's worth listening to the next hour and a half. So this afternoon we'll have some workshops. Uh, you can choose your workshops at lunchtime and basically go to whichever ones you want, but you'll see if you look at the programme, there's a choice of two out of three. So uh, when you've heard the morning uh, session, you can make a decision about what you want to do for the afternoon. And then we'll all finish up in here later. Um, one of the workshops is CPR training and uh, familiarisation with the defibs, and that will go on at the end of the room if that's what you prefer to do rather than uh, the other two, that's fine. Uh, so that's our hashtag if anybody wants to be uh, tweeting. If you haven't got the Wi-Fi password, it is uh, on the L LCFC conferences network. And the actual password is football with a capital F17. So if you want Wi-Fi, that's it. So what is SADS? Well, it is what it says on the tin. It's a sudden arrhythmia. So it comes out of the blue and your heart goes into a funny rhythm. Now, some people can have that and they don't necessarily die. And sometimes it presents with death as the very first anybody knew about it, which was the case for Joe. And the more we know about this in the medical profession, the more we realise that actually we might have been missing a few. So these are the latest statistics. Um, that is what Cardiac Risk in the Young, which is a, a very, very large national charity for this, organ, for this um, topic. This is their sort of estimate, but actually quite a lot of people think that it's a higher number than that. And it's still a lot of deaths from arrhythmias in people up to the age of sort of 35, 40. And most of people will remember, this is about five, six years ago now, I think that Fabrice went down on the pitch, and of course this was a, a big televised match, so this happened in front of the, the nations and the world's eyes, with everybody watching what went on. And as he collapsed and people started CPR, eventually people, it dawned on people that something serious was going on there. And Fabrice, fortunately, because of that CPR happening straight away, and the consultant cardiologist that the match, he got shocked many, many times, I'll cover that in a minute, He's now up there, out there with the Arrhythmia Alliance, another big charity, trying to, again, get the same message that CRY is preaching and that we are preaching, the same message about early CPR, because he has ended up, after an hour and a quarter of being technically dead, absolutely fully functioning as a normal person. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. We've had other footballers, all sorts of sports people collapsing, and you'll notice the word sports coming in there. We're going to talk about why sports has got anything to do with anything. Um, and unfortunately, local deaths, Leicestershire, Derbyshire, and quite a lot of work going on, on in the East Midlands to promote CPR. 
And that's where we started as a charity. And we've come an awful long way in four years and trained up thousands of school children. We've got hundreds of defibrillators out there. So I think we're doing a fantastic uh, job thanks to the work of the entire team. The team is a really big team to try and avoid the deaths and get people back to a, a normal neurological function, even if they have cardiac arrest. So what are these conditions? What is it that we're talking about? So a lot of the audience will know this already. For those of you who do know all of this stuff already, remember that people out there don't know this, and remember the sort of key things you need to say when you're trying to spread the word. So electrical currents make the heartbeat, but it also has a blood supply. And when people use the word heart attack, very often it's being used in the context of somebody who's 65 years old, who's a smoker, who's got high blood pressure, and is having a different disease from the disease that we're talking about today. And it's quite important for people to understand the difference. Because you need both bits of your heart to work. You need the electrics to work, and you need the blood to be going around some healthy vessels and feeding the, the heart with blood. So we all know the things that fur up the arteries, which is usually an older person's disease. And we're talking about the electrical side, which can affect people from the day they're born, but tends to show itself late childhood, sort of 8, 10, 12 years old, teenage years, and people in their 20s and early 30s. That's when these electrical problems become apparent. So it's a sort of short circuiting of the electrics at different levels in the heart that I'm about to explain. And that causes the heart to go to a funny rhythm. So instead of the normal pattern that we've all seen on the television with the usual blips that go along, with the normal top bit contracts, bottom bit contracts, suddenly everything goes to pot and the heart is just quivering or parts of the heart are just quivering, which causes either just palpitations or can lead immediately to death. So when we, when we speak, we need to be a little bit careful that we try and avoid the word heart attack, because a heart attack, generally speaking, is what people are trying to say as the older age disease caused by smoking and high blood pressure. So cardiac arrest is when your heart stops, and that's the phrase that we should be using, because that could be for any cause. So if I get hit by a bolt of lightning right now, if I've been a really bad person, I will have a cardiac arrest because a bolt of lightning made my heart stop. So let's just try and get our terminology um, a little bit correct. And when you see reports of people collapsing at, at the end of sports and, and dying, the media will often say that they, they've had a probable heart attack. What, it's just a little bit confusing to the public, I think, sometimes when we use these phrases. So the A of SADS is an arrhythmia, so it's the funny rhythm that we were just talking about. And it means that your heart can't synchronise properly. If it's not synchronising properly, it can't pump effectively, which means the blood doesn't go around your brain, doesn't go around your body, and you either start to feel funny, but you can stay standing, or you actually collapse and have a faint, or everything stops completely. If you just feel a bit funny and you stay standing, or you collapse and it sorts itself out, because it can do, and you wake up again, then those are the warning signs. And it's really important that we know that and we pick up on these warning signs. So those of us that work in general practice, a &E departments, school nurses, sports coaches, anybody who deals with young people running around needs to recognise these warning signs. Unfortunately, it runs in families as well. So a lot of these conditions have a genetic basis to them. And when you have, if you go to the bereavement workshop this afternoon, um, we've got Dr. Pradeep Basildevan, who's in one of our geneticists, going to talk about the impact this has on the whole family. Can you imagine, it's bad enough having a death in the family without them realising that the other family members might be prone to having the same thing, which is just what Martin has said to us. The rugby player who collapsed and died, and then exactly the same happened to his son. So it's a double whammy for the family. They've got this horrendous thing to deal with, and now realise other people are at risk as well quite difficult. And these are the warning signs that we need to look out for. So it can present with palpitations or fainting or collapsing and one of the clues is it's either during exercise or after exercise which is quite interesting because we don't really think of faints happening in that situation. So that's quite a big red flag warning bell to us if it actually happens during or straight after exercise. It can, it can be shortness of breath or chest pain during exercise. So an otherwise fit person suddenly realises they're getting more out of breath 
than all the other kids that are competing, all the other people that are in the game or in the race, <coughs> for no good reason, or with chest pain on exercise. But those two things are less common than the palpitations or the collapse. So what's it got to do with sports? Well, if you've got, if you're born with one of these conditions, and you push yourself really hard, and you exercising aerobically and your heart rate's gone up and it's 180, 200, because we're all down the gym, aren't we? We're making our hearts go that fast because it's good for us. And it is good for you. We mustn't get the message out there to the public that sports is bad for you and exercise is bad for you. However, if you're that, one in a hundred thousand or whatever it is, with this condition, it's at that time that your heart's going to say, can't cope. And that's why sports will bring out the arrhythmia. And so you will find that the highest recorded instance is in the US Marines. Not because the US Marines are unhealthy, but they're being pushed and pushed, and quite often in hot conditions. We all heard about the deaths in the Army and the Brecon Beacons. Some of those deaths were due to uh, their temperature being too high, but actually one or two of those deaths were from arrhythmia. Um, and once you're tuned into it, so of course, because of the charity, Steve Jones Lab gets a constant feed of examples from around the world. And it is quite astonishing, because those of us who are in the medical group of the, of the charity are getting a, an email every week or every fortnight from Steve. And it's just unbelievable in your email. You know, you've got America, you've got Australia, all the places around the world, and just endless numbers of, of people collapsing and dying. <coughs> but as Martin said, more and more often we're now seeing a state policy in one of the 52 states of the United States will be everyone now has to have a deep fib in all sports grounds and all schools. And there's another state and another state. And the Americans are actually probably the most ahead of the game in this. So there is a lot of good news, a lot more awareness in the last 10 years. And Fabrice has done his bit. 82 times he got defibrillated. For those of us who work in A&E departments or, or in cardiology, you know, we're used to shocking people two or three times. Um, and they'll come out of it, or if there's been a long downtime, we don't succeed at all. Most of us, by the fourth or fifth time, are really doubting ourselves and thinking we're not going to get this one back. 82 times, and he was okay, and went straight to a cardiac hospital where they could learn to treat him. He now has an internal defibrillation with a lot of campaigning. Well, now what I'm going to show you um, is a video of another player who died. just see what happened next or what didn't happen next. And that's why if you get detected early you can have an internal defibrillator. So by the way to cheer you up is to show you another video of a professional football player who decided he was going to carry on with his internal defib and you can see the difference that that makes in the next video.
sure keep on playing with your best idea. So you saw his whole body jerk as the defibrillator went, defibrillator went off and within 30 seconds he's up and talking and orientated and that's what defibrillation does. And anybody who works in a coronary care unit or in an AE department will see people who lose consciousness and within a minute wake up saying what's all the fuss about. That's what we want, that's the success that we want. And that's down to the chain of survival. So the chain of survival is about early CPR, early defibrillation and then getting people to the care that they need. And that's very much the goals of the trust. Um, other charities are doing a lot of work and uh, there have been a, a lot of campaigning through charities around the country. So we get, for example, Samuel Burrow, who's down in the south, and we've got other, um, like the Oliver King Foundation up in Liverpool, all trying to do the same work. And get the word out there that we need to get people trained in CPR and using defibs. So that includes other response services, not just the ambulance service. We need to get the fire and the police and everybody used to do CPR. And as I said, there are a lot of people out there off duty, walking past as well, who can do things, um, so that we get better by standard CPR rates. That's the fire crews being trained. But quite sadly, a lot of this is being driven by charities. It's not uh, necessarily being driven by the government. So CRY, Arrhythmia Alliance and us are all out there trying to get the message across about early CPR and early defibrillation. Um, Oliver King's uh, family have been down at government level with petitions about getting CPR into the school's curriculum and getting defibrillators in schools. So people are all tackling it at a slightly different angle but more or less the same message. And we go out there and teach the public. This is me and Dr. Ferguson out on the summer's day in the city centre. And just grabbing people and saying, have you got 20 seconds? Literally 20 seconds, we'll teach you CPR in 20 seconds. Because the airway part of CPR is optimum, but if, you, if that puts people off, it's much better that they just do hands-only CPR. And I've taught four-year-olds, I've taught six-year-olds. Um, I know some of my colleagues in the audience, they train their kids, the kids train the other kids. It is so not difficult. And if people want to see a video to help them, there's the British Heart Foundation has got the Vinnie Jones videos. There are various apps you can download on your phone. Just put in hands-only hands CPR or just CPR. You'll find something to teach you straight away. You don't even need to be fully trained. Ideally, be trained because then we can make sure it's being done correctly. Ideally, do the breaths. But if you just want somebody to do something in those crucial few minutes, really simplify it and get, and get people trained up in literally a minute and then they're off doing their shopping again. In terms of schools, as I said, um, there are, uh, in Leicestershire, we'd, we're ahead of the rest of the country in the number of school children that we've trained, um, and in America it's, in, it's compulsory in many states, but it's still a non-mandatory part of the school curriculum at the moment. It does feature there in the PS PSHE part of the curriculum, but it's not mandatory, which is crazy. I mean, I know I was taught an awful lot of rubbish in school that I'll never ever use in my life. But why not, as Martin said to us at the beginning, why not teach CPR in schools? It's fairly obvious. Um, now, when, when we had SADS Week last October, we had an audience of 18 and 19 year olds in Loughborough University, and there was about 120 people in the room, and I just said, can you put your hands up if you were taught CPR at school? And it was brilliant, about 90% of the audience put their hands up. So even though it's non-mandatory, it does seem like schools are teaching it, which is really hard. Um, so, at the time that uh, I wrote that slide, that figure was 14%, but I'm, I know it's higher than that, but I don't know the current numbers, and as I said, in Loughborough Uni, the number of people that put their hands up was amazing. The HeartWise programme, you're going to hear a little bit more from the HeartWise team later, so they're an organisation we work closely with here in Leicestershire, and the idea is to provide CPR and, and AED training to our Year 10 students and get those 14, 15 year olds out there they go home, they teach their parents, they teach each other, they keep each other confident because they've all learned it. Um, and actually that's a, it's an evidence-based age group to target because they're old enough to remember, old, but young enough to still give it a go, whereas so many adults are a little bit, oh, I'm not so sure. Kids are just in there, just doing it. Um, and we've been working collaboratively to get this into the schools program to the stage where the teachers know how to do it, the students know how to do it, and then the following year they all train each other, so it's just an ongoing thing. And in countries where that's happened, places like Norway, and we've made it a mandatory part of the school's curriculum, 
bystander rates for any cardiac arrest of any cause out there in the big wide world have gone from sort of 12, 14, 15%, which is what most, uh, which is the response you get in most situations, right up to 70, 80% in those countries where for 10 years they've been teaching it in schools. And that's a massive difference to someone's survival rates to have that chance that that person walking past you in the street knows what to do and will give it a go. We're also, as well as schools, are doing work in sports clubs. So Anna Harrison White is in the audience has done an amazing job of getting the, the sports uh, clubs uh, all trained up and getting them to buy the AEDs. So the current price for an AED is somewhere, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, we're about £900, I think, at the moment. But actually, an awful lot of clubs have got enough people that if they just chipped in £1, £2, £5, they could afford to get a defibrillator. Uh, and many have been motivated to do that, as well as there have been schemes from the British Heart Foundation. Um, so we've just got, we've had one for our village which came free from the British Heart Foundation. And there are other sort of fund matching schemes out there as well. So uh, um, you'll hear the statistics at the end of the day, but we've literally got hundreds of defibs out there in Leicestershire now, just to get this chain of survival actually making a difference. I sincerely hope that my cardiology colleagues and I, in another few years, when we start looking at what the bystander rates have been and survival rates for our Leicestershire, um, what we call pre-hospital cardiac arrests, that's out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, I sincerely hope we'll be able to look at that trend in another two, four years' time and see that it's gone like that with time. <coughs> So it's all about acting quickly and having some basic um, knowledge about defibrillators, which are really so simple to use. And Steve said to me a few years ago that an LED should be as common as a fire extinguisher. So we've walked into this room and you know for a fact you're going to find some fire extinguishers. Well, why isn't it the same for an LED? How many of us have been involved in a fire? Hopefully, not many. So, you know, in terms of the population risk, it's actually more likely that you'll be in a room where a cardiac arrest has happened. Um, there are places in the US, I've been to Sedona in Arizona, they are literally on every street corner. It's a rich town, but they are literally on every street corner. But as Martin said, you can drive through the villages now and the phone boxes will have defibs in, you go past schools, you go past um, all, all the local buildings run by the local authorities and there'll be defibs around. So people are getting much more comfortable with the idea that actually this is something that the public can use, not just to somebody in the back of an ambulance. Um, fortunately, I heard last night, uh, Dr. Mark Wilson, who's a consultant neurosurgeon in London, is able to make it with us today. He's got to do a ward round in London first and then get on the train up here this morning. But he's going to say a few words about this app, so I'm not going to tell you about that. He'll be with us at about lunchtime, and he's going to tell you about the app that he's invented to get um, uh, bystander CPR happening up and down the country more, uh, more frequently than it does. So that's the sort of basics covered and really it, it's that we do need to remember that heart disease isn't just a disease of older people when it's an electrical problem it's the young person's disease what we're going to talk about as well today is the effect that that first death might have on the family and what needs to happen next to screen the rest of the family to make sure we don't have a second death and for us to be aware of the fact that these quite soft symptoms sometimes of dizziness and palpitations are quite common. You know, I'm still standing here and I've had palpitations and I've had dizziness in my life and I'm sure most people have. But if it happens on exercise or if it seems a bit more dramatic or if somebody truly is unconscious for a while, and we're going to cover that in the next session, you, you actually need to stop and think, is there something going on here? There's some useful websites that have got medical content on there, so if you want to go back and rehearse your ECG skills or some of the facts, and particularly things like the incidence of these different conditions, those are quite useful websites. And as we said, we'll get this to you uh, on a USB stick by the end of the day, so you'll have those. So that's the sort of basics of what that is.